Okay, <clears throat> so welcome back. Um, I hope everybody had a nice lunch break. And now I'm very happy to introduce um, a Django core developer, but more importantly for this talk, um, employee of Elasticsearch, the company, um, Honza Kral. Hello. Hello. Uh, so I'd like to tell you a story. It's a story about how we developed five clients for Elasticsearch in five different languages without losing our minds in the process much. Uh, and so as any good story, it starts a long time ago in a galaxy. No, no, no. It starts actually when we looked at the current landscape of, of the clients for Elasticsearch. And uh, there were some things that we liked and what we've seen are good and some things not so much. For example, in the, in the Python landscape, there are many clients, but none of them actually implemented the entire set of APIs. None of them uh, did everything that we would like to see in a client, and none of them did it uh, on a scale that we would, we would be comfortable with. As a result, users had inconsistent experience with Elasticsearch itself, and naturally they, they blamed Elasticsearch because of the way they interfered, uh, interfaced with it was not ideal. So we decided to uh, create our own clients, sort of to control uh, the, the last mile, how people talk to Elasticsearch, so we can make sure that their experience is good and consistent. So, we started with the, with the design, obviously. And we sat down and, and said all, all the things that we want our clients to be. And for that, we need to start with Elasticsearch Elastic, Elastic itself. Elasticsearch is distributed. That brings a lot of problems with it and a lot of opportunities. It talks uh, via the REST API over HTTP, which is both good and bad, because it's good that it can be deceptively easy to create your own clients. The, the number of clients just in Python or just in Ruby was staggering just because everyone thought that, oh, it's just HTTP, right? I, I can just do an HTTP request and everything will be good. But there are a lot of corner cases there that they didn't count with. Uh, there's also a lot of diverse uh, um, uh, deployments of Elasticsearch. Some people just deploy uh, the cluster in their own networks and talk to it directly. Others would use uh, load balancers. Uh, some people would use alternate transport like Thrift uh, to, gain some, to gain some speed or would use a set of client nodes and a distributed multi-rack setup or something like that. And also just the set of endpoints that Elasticsearch has is quite staggering. It's almost 100 API endpoints with almost 700 parameters that the clients all need to support and document. But more than that, we wanted the clients to be true to their language. That's why we only developed the four or five in the beginning, because those were the people that we had. We, we, had, a, we had a Python engineer, yours, yours truly here. Uh, we, had a, we had an excellent Ruby developer, a Perl developer. We even managed to find a really great PHP guy, believe it or not. So those were the clients that we started with, because we felt confident that we can actually make it feel like a Pythonic library, not like a library written by a, by a Java guy in his spare time in Python. And we wanted the client to be for everyone. We wanted people not to have any excuse to use it. So that's my first lesson that we learned. No opinions, no decisions. In order to make sure that everyone would use the client, we had to abstain from any, making any observations any decisions because whenever you have an opinion, there is someone out there who would disagree with you. So the only way how to make sure that that won't happen is not to have any opinions. So we decided the client should be low level, just essentially a one-to-one -one mapping to, to the rest layer. Uh, and they should be extensible. Uh, we, we should design them in such a way that where you don't like some aspect of it, you should be able to replace it or just hook into it and change it. So we came up with this. This is a, for, for, an, for an HTTP client, this is a kind of complicated uh, diagram that specifies how the client works. 
You have, you have the client itself that has a, a transport class, which has a serializer to serialize and deserialize data as, as they go over the wire. Then you have a connection pool that actually stores a list of connections. Uh, connection pool in this case is a misnomer because it actually doesn't pool collections, it just holds a, a collection of connections to individual nodes in the cluster. Uh, you can see why we would have the naming problem there. And then we have, uh, then we have connection. By default, we use Eurolib3 because that uh, ended up to be the best one for, uh, for Python. And uh, we also have a connection selector. So when you connect to multiple nodes, uh, they control the strategy on how do you do load balancing. Uh, do you use random or do you use round robin? By default, we uh, do round robin over a randomized uh, list of nodes. And the goal wh uh, why we did it uh, this way is so that we are able to give you the option of override any simple uh, component in here just by subclassing uh, the default implementation and filling in all the blanks. So some examples. Um, if you want to create your own selector, you just create the class and you pass it in. Everything is essentially uh, using dependency injection, so you can just pass it in as a constructor parameter, and we will use that instead. So you see three examples here. The, uh, the first one is not really uh, not really injecting your own code, it's just setting up the options. So the first one instructs the client to talk to the, talk to the cluster and get the li current list of nodes on startup, then whenever a node fails, and then also every, every 60 seconds. This is excellent for a long running process, let's say a, a, a web server. So that even when you keep changing your, your Elasticsearch cluster, you keep adding nodes and nodes keep dropping out, you still talk to all the nodes that are available. The second one is where you want to uh, control the, the load balancing. For example, imagine a scenario when you have two racks and you want to, uh, by default, only talk to the Elasticsearch nodes in the same rack as the application server and only fall back to the nodes in the other rack if none of those are available. You can do that. You can just uh, write a simple class that will, that will do this. So that's, uh, that's what we uh, mean when we say that we are modular and extensible. Uh, the last example is just uh, using a thrift connection, which we actually provide as, a, as an optional plugin, and uh, using a different serializer, in this case YAML, because why not? Some people like YAML better than JSON for some reason. So that was, the, that was sort of the first lesson. No opinion, so uh, people have no excuses not to use it. The second lesson was to prototype everything. Because you just don't come up with something like this without some preparation, without some prototyping. And more importantly, you don't come up with it for a single language and have it be applicable for all the others. It's very difficult to find a pattern that would work for both Python people and Ruby people, for example. That's why we created a, a spike, a, a, a prototype implementation in both Python and Ruby, sort of to make sure that uh, the design will work, that the design will hold for both of these languages. And also, so that we have a reference that we can talk about, that we can, uh, we can have the same terminology, and then when we talk about connection pool, we know what we mean, even though it means different things in different languages, and even how we use it, it's not exactly correct, but we had code that actually showed what it does, so we could have, at that point, a clear conversation, even with, uh, even with the PHP and Perl people even with the JavaScript people that came on, and even later with, uh, with .NET uh, people who, who are developing the new client now. So, prototype everything, not just to see if your, if your design works, but also th that you have something to, to talk about, that you are absolutely certain that you're on the same page. Because you should never trust humans and uh, just their understanding if you can do more. So that's the, that's the next lesson. Uh, the next lesson is don't send a man to do a machine's job. Humans are amazing. They are amazing in a lot of things. Consistency, not one of them. 
Consistency in repetitive tasks, you really want to have something that doesn't get tired, that doesn't get frustrated, that don't, doesn't mind doing the same thing over and over again. To me, that sounds like a computer. So this lesson states that you should automate as much as possible. And this, why I'm talking about this is, I already mentioned we have almost 100 API endpoints with 700 parameters. That's very difficult to track. That's a lot of work, a lot of boring, tedious work that you don't really want to be doing. You don't hire a, 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 a decent Python being and force them to maintain a list of 100 APIs and 700 uh, parameters mm. if there is any other way. So what other way is there? So first we thought that we could do a reference implementation. We can just arbitrarily choose one of the clients and decide this is how it should. This is uh, the reference implementation for our APIs. This is the authoritative collection of all the APIs, all the parameters, their possible values and descriptions. But that doesn't really scale that well. First of all, we only have one person per language. We only have one Python developer. We only have one Perl guy. We only have one PHP guy. So what if, what if he leaves? What if he's on vacation and there is a change that needs to be made? Like, and also, how, do you, how does that person make sure that everything is, everything is synchronous? We found out even with the spike implementation of the, of the transport layer that maintaining it when we add more features and we need to add it to both Python and Ruby, even though uh, it was just two of us, and coincidentally, the two of us that lived in the same city, which is not true for any other two people on the project, it was very difficult. It was difficult to keep in sync. So we discarded reference implementation as an option. Next, we looked at documentation. Because obviously, Elasticsearch has documentation, and all the APIs are documented. Uh, all the parameters are documented as well. But again, they are documented for humans. It's a documentation that's intended for, for the developers to read it and to understand it, to make sense of it. So again, it would require a tremendous uh, manual labor just to make sure that everything that we need is there. Someone would have to read actually all the documentation, collect all the all, uh, all the stuff, and not just one person, but each and every author of the client would have to do that. That's a very tedious job, a job that I, I haven't signed up for, and I, I doubt we would ever find a person who would sign up for, for a job like that. So what other options were there? We found uh, the progress from, uh, from reference implementation to documentation had some, had some promise but it wasn't there yet. So we decided to take it one step further, to actually extract all the information that's already in the documentation, that's already in the code, and present it in a, in a structured format. So we chose a format that's human readable and machine parsable, and we at Elasticsearch, we really love JSON. So we just decided that we should document everything in JSON and create a spec a former specification uh, for our APIs. This is the one case where I was super happy that Elasticsearch is written in Java as a statically uh, typed language because it provides you with a bunch of tools so we were actually able to write a tool that would just uh, parse the source code for all the APIs and extract 90-80% of all the APIs and its parameters in in an automated fashion. And we then just had to go once over it, and we could actually share in this effort all of the client people, and just fill in the caps. Uh, fill in the, the documentation for each of the parameter, uh, fill in uh, the option and the, the type, whether this option is required or not, whether it's a list or, or a single value, a boolean or an integer. So that made the effort so much easier, and going forward, also so much easier to define. 
So what did we choose to, to capture in this, in this document? First of all, the, uh, the URL path. All the different variants of URL path, uh, if, you, if, if it was dynamic, which most of the URLs in Elasticsearch are, it can optionally in, uh, include an index name or a list of indices on, on which to perform the, uh, the action. Uh, it can include other dynamic, dynamic parts. So we have to document those, including all the different options, how the URL can look. As part of it also, uh, we had to do the HTTP, uh, HTTP methods. So is it a get or post? We decided to do very little than that. Just to list all the parameters, list all the ways how to combine them into URL. We didn't actually capture all the dependencies. That this parameter is only valid if this parameter is set to blah. We just uh, found out that we don't really want to have this information, this validation in the client, and we'll instead decide on our users to use it directly. So that way we would have less overhead with maintaining it, and it would, uh, the, code would be, the code would be much simpler. So how does it look? This is, this is an example uh, for, for the Suggest API. This is just a fraction of it. And you can see that we have a link to the documentation. We have all the possible HTTP methods. So in this case, post or get. We have the, uh, all the different forms of the URL paths with the description for each, uh, for each part. So here there is only one dynamic part, which is the in optional index. And we have description of all the parameters. We also have a description of the body, what it contains, and information, whether it's required or not. And this is all the information I need to write, or in my case, to pre-generate uh, a Python method. I have the name, I have the list of parameters, I know which ones are required and which ones are optional, so I can actually choose that these ones will be positional, these one will be keyword, and I have um, the way how to actually put all those information together to create a URL and send it over to the server. The last nice thing about this is it minimizes the effort to maintain it because we stuck it in, into the same repository as Elasticsearch code base is, the same repository where, where the documentation is, and that meant that uh, updating this just meant that whenever I make a change in Elasticsearch itself, whether I add a new API or just add a parameter, inside the same commit or, or pull request, I also provide changes towards the specif specification. And then all the client people, all they need to do is just monitor this one directory in, on GitHub to see all the changes that they need to implement in their client. But again, we, we approach the, the, the difficult thing, like people need to watch something and do something. And, and whenever you rely on people, uh, you will get into trouble sooner or later. Hopefully later, but you will probably get into trouble. So that brings us to our last lesson. Test everything. Don't trust. Uh, just verify everything. In our case, uh, we needed to verify that all the clients are consistent and that they work well with the server. So again, we created our own solution and uh, we created a unified test suite. We again uh, uh, took a machine parsable language, in this case YAML, and created a simple, simple test suite with a setup and a, and a bunch of actions and a bunch of assertions uh, that enabled uh, the code to run not only against uh, Elasticsearch itself, but also against all the clients. So this is how it looks. So this is again a test for the Suggest API, and you can see there is a setup that will actually uh, call an action called index with the parameter of index type ID and body. And it will then do a refresh, so it will make uh, the document available for search. And then it will, there's one test, the basic tests for Suggest API. And it will actually perform the Suggest operation and then run two assertions. So this uh, test validates that the Suggest API is actually capable of correcting our typos. And this is a test that is 
uh, run as part of the Java test suite, as part of the integration tests. And so that means that it's version specific. It's in the same code base. So whenever you have a branch of Elasticsearch, it can have its own, uh, its own test suite, uh, just, like, just like any other tests. And also, all the clients have an interpreter for these tests that makes uh, us sure that we have the same naming, we have the same API coverage, uh, we have the same exception handling because we can not just run assertions, but we can also run assertions that, that this should fail with this error code. And just by specifying it once, uh, we can make sure that all the clients are consistent. These set of tools together uh, led to that when we decided to develop the fifth client after the original four, it only took a few weeks for the, for the JavaScript AI to write uh, an interpreter for the, for the test suite and the parser for the API specification and make sure that everything is working as it's supposed to. So these were my lessons that, that, we, that we learned uh, during, during this process. It was, it was good times, it was bad times, but uh, we, we made it through and uh, I believe that the clients are, are working well for people and now we're sort of approaching the, the next stage and that is to actually create more high-level opinionated clients that will be more helpful to end, our end users, but also for those clients, we are okay with people not using them. So thank you very much, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to hear them. Thank you. So, questions? Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Did you uh, try to think about if it was possible to generate the client completely? Since you already have everything in theory. You have the parameters, you have the return value. Uh, so some clients actually do that. Uh, for example, the JavaScript client, it doesn't actually contain much source code. It just actually internalizes the, the JSON specification and it generates the method on the fly. Uh, for Python, I actually wrote a script to generate the entire client and I used it as, as the first draft and then I edited it manually because uh, it's great to automate everything but usually it's okay to automate just 90% and don't try to catch, catch it all and just do the 10% manually. It's the classic 80-20 problem. So I started with the generated code and then I filled in all the exceptions, uh, all the exceptions to the rule. So now when there is a change, I run the generation process again, and I manually look at the diff and, and uh, see what parts uh, represent a, a, an actual change and what was just a manual edit that I had to do in order for the API to actually fear more like Python. Okay, have you been uh, trying or considering to use the protocol buffers from Google? Uh, so, uh, well, Yes, we have, we have actually considered that as an alternative transport. Currently, we are fine with just HTTP and, and JSON, though we provide some alternatives. There is an, uh, there is an experimental uh, transport with a memcache protocol and Redis protocol and Thrift. Uh, we haven't looked that much longer uh, on protobuf because the, the trade-off didn't seem to be that huge to, to warrant that, uh, that investment. However, we are, still, we are still looking for more effective uh, transports and encoding schemas, so it might still happen. It's definitely something that you can implement yourself in a plugin for both the clients and the server. Questions? No more questions? Okay, then that's it. Thank you again. Thank you very much.